she points to the serpent and says, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. God had given an explicit command, and it was not obeyed. There was a direct question, Where art thou? God says. And then a runaround starts. And there's an indirect answer to his direct question. Well, I heard your voice and I was afraid I was naked and I was hiding myself. There, there, another direct question comes. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? An indirect answer comes. Well, the woman that you gave me, she caused me to eat. So he blames the woman and, and then blames God himself, the woman that you gave me. Then there's a direct question to Eve. What is, what is this that thou hast done? And then the indirect answer that she gives, the serpent beguiled me. Well, God gave the plain command. And Adam and Eve, they disobeyed. Knowing the consequences of their decision. But they, they wouldn't face the main issue. They made their excuses. So now you know why your own kids behave the way they do. When, they, when they're confronted with their own disobedience. You also know why you behave the way you do when you're confronted with your say. Excuse making is popular today for, for not attending church. Oh, the distance is too far. Oh, the weather's too bad. Oh, there's business that I have to take care of. Oh, I'm not feeling quite like it today. Oh, the services are too long. Or oh, the services are too short. Oh, I don't like so-and-so. I don't like the preacher there. I don't like that lady or that man. Uh, they worked hard all week and now it's time to rest. Oh, we're on vacation. We're not going to church. These excuses don't seem to come up but if the destination is a shopping mall or a sporting event. Well, is church attendance that important that we should take the time to go? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 answers it this way. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Okay? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day of the Lord approaching. King David had the correct heart attitude when it came time to assemble with the saints. In Psalm 122, verse 1, he says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad? Are you happy to come to church? Are you glad to hear the word of the Lord and apply His wisdom to your own life? It was commented by the Queen of Sheba after she had visited King Solomon, Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. 2 Chronicles 9 verse 7. Job, that Old Testament saint said, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. And again David in Psalm 146 5, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And Proverbs 3.13, Solomon wrote, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Now you won't find better wisdom this side of heaven than you'll find in this here book, the Holy Bible. When we meet together for church, this is the book we read from. These are the words we hear, the words we believe. They are God's words. They are precious words. And they'll guide you to eternal life and guide you through this life. Are you happy with those words? Where else are you going to get encouragement? And how else will you encourage others if not with the assembling of the saints together? Yes, church attendance is important because of the things we do here. There are also popular excuses for rejecting the salvation that God offers us through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, there's too many hypocrites in the church. People say they're Christians and they're not acting like Christians. And that's true. There are many different churches. Hard to choose which one I should be going to. There's a preoccupation sometimes with worldly interests and delights. Or, usually if I just can't live up to what is required of me. 
They're all flimsy excuses. And they're not going to be accepted by the Lord in the day of judgment. Excuse making is also a deceitful business as well. It deceives no one but the one who makes the excuses. The world knows better. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel, my friends, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 verses 1 through 4. But he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication, wickedness and covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. <coughs> Excuse me. These know the judgment of God, but choose to commit these sins in pleasure. John 3.19, Jesus said, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. These know the difference between light and darkness. They choose darkness, and they will end up in outer darkness. Revelation 19 verse 20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then Revelation 20 verse 10 says, And the devil that they see them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's the outerness. That's the outer darkness. Galatians 6 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You're going to reap what you sow. Even a gardener gets an illustration of God's truth. Spiritually applied, you sow to the fleshly desires and lusts, you're going to reap corruption. But if you sow unto the Spirit, you'll, leap, you'll reap life everlasting. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Now the Lord knows us. It says in John 2, 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name. And when they saw the miracles which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Our excuses are also inconsistent with our actions. Compared with seeking uh, <clears throat> to escape the doctor's orders, you go to a doctor for help and he gives you the remedy. He expects you to follow that and if you don't follow it, you don't get healed. You, you think he's a quack. When the onus is on yourself for not following what he had prescribed for you to do. Common sense is needed when we understand the word of God as well. Let's be the man that face the facts about ourselves. I am what I am I what I ought to be, or could be, spiritually speaking. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, it says in 2 Peter 3 9. As some men count slackness, but will is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away. They'll pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall not with fervent heat. 
The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now, what have you got your eyes on, dear friend? Are you one of them who are, are looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God? Are you looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why not? It's time to face the facts and quit with the excuses, my friend. Am I really what I want to be? Are you everything you want to be to the Savior? Are you everything you want to be towards your wife or your husband or to your children? Are you everything you want to be for your church? Are you everything you want to be for your employer? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He was small in his own eyes, the Apostle Paul. And he gave God all the glory for everything that was accomplished. God who had enabled him to accomplish what he had done just for the Lord himself. Are you everything you really want to be for God's glory? It's time to put away the weak excuses and determine to go on to perfection in the power of God for the glory of God. Thirdly, am I what I could be if I surrendered to the Lord? Have you ever considered what it would be like at this point in time if Adam and Eve had obeyed rather than disobeyed God? Let's face the cold hard facts here. We were at a disadvantage at one time. We were without hope and without God in this world. According to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. The fact is we were all hopeless and godless. But now, but now, right now, in Christ Jesus, Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ himself. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us and God, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth together unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Listen, my friend, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, think of what is yours because you're in Him. 1 Corinthians 3.21, Paul says, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death, or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. We are made nigh unto God. We have peace with God. We have access to God. We are in the household of God. We are on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We are in the holy temple of the Lord. We are in the habitation of God. We are more than conquerors through Christ. We have received grace. We have now received the atonement. We have such a hope. 
We have heavenly treasure on earth and vessels. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have obtained an inheritance. We have boldness. We have confidence in the Lord. We have great joy and consolation. We have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. In the word of God, we have fellowship with Him. We have passed from death unto life. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Is this not enough for you to see that have you given yourself completely to the God who bought you, who purchased you with His own blood? Are you honoring Him and glorifying Him? 2 Peter 1, 3 says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things and the, uh, is blind, they cannot see afar off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. My friends, the only way to have your sins purged is through the blood of Jesus Christ, because only through the blood it can only the blood of Jesus Christ can purge you of your sins. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no cleansing of sin. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a promise of God, my friend. That's right out of the Holy Scriptures. Now, dear brother and sister in the Lord, do you lack these things in your life? If you do, you're blind to the truth which is in Christ Jesus and have forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. Revelation 2, 5, Remember therefore for once thou art fallen and repent. With the abundance of God's grace, no excuse will stand in the judgment seat of Christ for believers. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 1 John 2.28 tells us that now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Will you surrender your will to Him now? Will you? All things are yours, my friend, in Christ. Excuse making is also a very dangerous business. Are you unsaved? If you died today, would you awaken to hell? Hell is a real place. It's just as real as heaven. But it's totally different. Those who reject the Lord will be rejected by the Lord. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Perhaps you consider yourself a decent religious person. Are you doing the will of the Father in heaven? Or are you following the will of your church? By the way, do they coincide with each other? Is what your church teaching you to do, is that, can you find it in the Bible? Is there some kind of foundational truth in the Bible that you can base what you do on? If it's not in the Word of God, it's a tradition of men and should be expelled. Do you know what the will of the Father in heaven is? John 6, 40 says, And this is the will of Him that sent me, Jesus said, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. That's a promise. Right from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 12, 48 says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, Jesus said, the same shall judge him in the last day. Oh yes, the books will be open. Men will pay with their life for rejecting God's Son for salvation. Acts 16, 30, a man asked this question. What must I do to be saved? He was in a frenzy. He was about to take his own life. Because he thought that he was going to be put to death by the authorities because he was a prison keeper. And there were Paul and Silas in this jail. They were singing at midnight, giving praise unto the Lord. 
And an earthquake came and opened up the prison doors and he, he feigned to kill himself. He came running in and he said, Man, he says, what must I do to be saved? And they said this to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. They didn't tell them, well, you need to be baptized. They didn't say, well, you know, you need to, uh, re uh, you need to live a good life first. They didn't say you have to come down to the synagogue and become a member of the synagogue. No. He said, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. My friends, don't think you're going to change and then believe. Believe first and Christ will do the changing for you. He'll, he'll save you. He'll He'll make you born again and you'll change. You'll become a new creature in Christ. But you have to be in Him. And the only way to be in Him is to receive Him as your Savior. John 3.17 says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus Christ, His Son, might be saved. John 10.9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. We speak of Psalm 23, the still waters and the green pastures. Jesus gives these things when you believe on him as, his, as your Savior. Acts 2, verse 21 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not on any other name, not some saint's name, no, not some preacher's name, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the name of the Lord. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name, none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You see the imperative here. We must be saved, and we can only be saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Perish where? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Dear friend, no excuse will do on that day. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. Thank you for allowing us to come into your homes today. God bless you. Amen. i